Were Roman cities like Rome itself built in a day? Is it true that Roman baths were always so crowded that it was impossible to stretch out full length? Was the Circus Maximus really the greatest show on earth? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about how and why Roman towns and cities, both planned and organic, were typically laid out. How Roman cities were supplied with fresh water and disposed of their sewage and waste. The buildings and structures found in a typical Roman city and their purpose, and the buildings, structures, and monuments found in the most typical Roman city, Rome itself. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. Like the Greeks and most other peoples, Roman towns and cities were of two kinds, planned and unplanned, or one might say organic. And most towns and cities of ancient Italy, including Rome itself, were the latter, growing without restriction or planning as seen in the layout of their roads and streets, which had no pattern other than taking account of their topography. The first planned towns in Italy were those of the Greek colonies. You see that here, the plan of Thurii in Calabria and Heraclea in Lucania. These had a rectangular street grid of wide avenues intersected by narrower streets, a central place for public buildings, temples, and an agora, or marketplace, which influenced the development of Etruscan towns. As you see here, a plan of Etruscan Flarii and the plan of Etruscan Canuna. That's what I call it. From whence came the layout of Roman towns. The Roman plan town was normally square, sometimes rectangular in shape, with two main streets running north-south and east-west, which you can see here. Crossing at the center of town, the rest of the streets on a grid pattern of streets crossing at 90 degree angles. However, on occasion, the topography might cause a colony to be a bit irregular in shape. For example, we see here Roman Cosa in Tuscany, Tiberius in Judea, Dura Europus on the Euphrates, and Londinium in Britannia. However, every town was normally walled, with a strip of land, the Poimerium, on the outside of the walls where no buildings were allowed or cultivation. Clearly for defensive reasons, though the Romans always claimed there were religious reasons behind it. As has been observed by many others in the past, Roman colonies in their layout resembled Roman military camps, as shown here, for several reasons. One, they're usually built to be defensible. So why not just follow the pattern of the highly defensible military camp? Secondly, the legions and their engineers were the ones who laid out these towns. So again, 
go with what one knows. Three, many of the first settlers had served in the legions. So again, go with what one knows. And finally, fourth, Roman military camps were modeled on the grid patterns of Etruscan gridded colonies, which in turn were, as mentioned above, modeled on the grid patterns of Greek gridded colonies. The first roads, even the two main roads in a planned settlement, would have been made with dirt, unless one or both of these were already existing paved Roman roads. But as the settlement grew and prospered, these were paved with stone with curbs and the occasional raised stone pathway, a crepidines. The crepidines, you see them here in Pompeii, for example. Very nicely done here. And the curbs as well. The crepidines were built to allow pedestrians to cross the streets without having to step down into the street itself which might be filled with all sorts of muck and garbage. And the gaps between the crepidines, designed to be wide enough for passage by wheeled cars, wagons, or even the occasional chariot. In the center of every Roman town, as shown here, was a forum. And the forum was a large square set in planned towns, similar functions to the Greek agora as a place to meet and socialize, argue and discuss, legislate and vote, buy and sell goods, and litigate. This would have been surrounded, the forum, by public buildings with a colonnaded portico for shops and offices on at least two sides of the forum, a basilica at the end and underneath the buildings, what is known today as a crypto portico for storage. There may also be statues of famed locals or emperors, maybe a victory arch or some other kind of monument, and some public temples, including a town of, excuse me, a temple of Jupiter on the northern end of the forum. The town's public baths would be nearby. A typical town usually had only one forum, but large cities such as Rome developed a number of fora, the plural of forum, and specific marketplaces as shown here. There is the forum holatorium for vegetables, the forum boarium for cattle, the forum piscardium for fish, the forum venalium for prepared food, the forum suarium for pork and ham and bacon, the forum pistorium for bread, the Forum Venarium for wine and the Forum Cupetinus for spices and other delicacies. Of course, the most magnificent forum was the Roman Forum, shown here. Again, uh, this is the Roman Forum at the time of the Republic. The Forum is this part right here. And here is the plan of the Forum during the Empire. That's the plan, and these are a bit of a kind of a reconstructions of what they would have looked like. Now, the Roman Forum started as the marketplace of the first settlers on the Aventine and the Palatine. So that would have been the Palatine here, the Aventine up here. Why? Because originally it lay in a marshy area where no one wanted to live and hence was neutral ground. It will later be drained by the Etruscans. Anyway, as a center of what became the imperial city, its buildings were made of marble, as was the main road through it, the Sacra Via, or you see it here, the Sacred Way, with statues and victory arches scattered through it. The original purpose of the Roman Forum was, of course, selling goods. So as the city expanded, so did the forum, or should we say, a number of fora were added by the emperors, with new porticos, basilicae, and spaces for selling goods and services. So, if we see example here, this is the original, the imperial fora, 
and the original Roman Forum would have been down here. This is Vespasian's Forum, the Forum of Peace. This is the Forum of Nerva, this little uh, space in between. Why? Because at first you had the Forum of Augustus, then Vespasian built his later, and then the Forum of Nerva was built to connect them. This is the old Forum of Julius Caesar. And later the Forum of the Emperor Trajan. Here is what the Emperor's Trajan's Forum would have looked like. And the Forum of Augustus with the giant Temple of Mars Ultor. Water supply came, hopefully, from a nearby water source for Roman towns, such as springs, rivers, or lakes, but mostly wells, which stone cisterns in the larger towns for use as reservoirs. Though, when a town's population outstripped its water supply, or a town was unluckily located downstream from a major city or two, these cities, of course, tending to pollute the rivers on which they sat because they simply dumped all their waste and garbage in it. An aqueduct would be built to bring in fresh, clean water, which would also be used to supply the baths. And here, of course, we see the various, the various aqueducts that brought water into ancient Rome. An aqueduct normally ran on the ground, or sometimes buried underground, the water flowing downhill via stone pipes or covered channels, but those above ground, those with which we are most familiar, would be needed to cross gullies, ravines, and valleys, or to ensure proper flow, all of course being done simply through gravity. But no matter if it was on the ground, above the ground, or below the ground, the conduits were designed to fill only half full. This way, it would allow slaves to enter and clean out the calcium carbonate deposits, which affected the flow. And of course, this is the typical below ground aqueduct. The masonry channel, this is, could be the above ground one, though here you might also use ceramic pipes. And this is the interior of the aqueduct of Trajan. The aqueduct terminated, as shown really here in this map of ancient Rome, at the highest part of town. And if needed, the aqueduct was engineered so the water would rush down a slope then up again from the force of the rush downwards, then flow into a settling tank, after which it went to a distribution tank, and thence, via stone, ceramic, lead, even leather or wood conduits or pipes, to a variety of nodes throughout the town, including public baths or fountains, even to the houses of the wealthy, who would have paid extra for this privileged hookup. Based on the work of the Roman engineer Frontinus, Rome's aqueducts brought in 17 and a half to 35 million cubic feet of water every single day, which is about 262 million gallons or enough for the daily usage of about 2.4 million Americans. But since the water flow could not be turned off, water diversion was critical, otherwise the whole city would begin to flood. So once all the reservoirs were full and daily usage accounted for, underground sewers carried off the overflow along with all waste and sewage. These sewers were normally built of stone, sometimes wood, with access via manholes every so often for slaves to go down to clean and repair them. 
And again, we see it here. This is the, all these little pictures, these little areas here. These are the sewer and private toilet outlets in Pompeii. This is Rome's Cloaca Maximum, the main sewer, built largely by the Etruscans, at least at first. And the root of it, as you see it here in red, uh, which goes down right to the river, and is really this Cloaca Maxima, which drained the marsh area, which will become the Roman Forum. And you see a bit here of the Baths of Caracalla and how they worked. Now, these included the Roman pit toilets, which famously lacked any stalls for privacy, as you see here, actual remnants from Ostia. These are depictions of what they would have looked like probably elsewhere, where people, men or women, as far as I know, there were no women's rooms versus men's rooms, would just hike up their tunics and go, wiping themselves with either rounded pebbles or sponge sticks. And the sponge stick you can kind of see here. This guy has his own sponge stick here as well. Another one here. So a sponge stick was, given the price of actual sponges, reusable. Simply a sponge on a stick where you would wipe yourself. And I've always felt sorry for the poor slave whose job was to wring out the sponge stick after every use. Every town and city also had a variety of temples dedicated to their own deities, be they Roman, Greek, Egyptian, Gallic, Iberian, Germanic, or whatever, sometimes all combined. Besides the street grid, fortifications, aqueducts, and fora, every planned Roman town included all the buildings the Romans thought necessary for civilized life, as seen here in these maps of Roman colonies. Trier on the Rhine, Pompeii, of course, Timgad in what's now North Africa, Londinium, London, and Leptis Magna also in North Africa. Largely, this would be in Libya today. So, what would they include? An amphitheater for gladiatorial fights, which might also include fights of slaughter of various animals. A theater for plays and comedies and the occasional public meetings, though Roman theaters, unlike Greek theaters, were not carved into a hillside, but built as a structure from the ground up. There would have been a circus. No, not the type of clowns. A circus for chariot and horse races. Common throughout the Greek East and Greek colonies in the West was the stadion, or stadium, which only appears in some Roman towns and cities after the opening of the Stadium of Domitian in Rome in 86 AD. And these were then for athletic events other than gladiator contests and horse and chariot racing. So, for example, discus, long jump, foot races, throwing uh, the javelin, etc. The colonies would also usually have included a basilica for indoor shopping, away from the glare and heat of the sun, and a variety of courtrooms and offices. There were a number of public and private thermi or baths, where rich and poor could bathe, swim, wrestle, work out, lift weights, read books from the Thermas library, and especially relax and socialize at nominal cost, since it was all paid for by the town government. Now, private baths did exist, and they would charge daily attendance or maybe an annual fees for membership for those wishing a more private or perhaps a more exclusive experience. Now, this is the Baths in Bearsden. 
reconstructed in the Antonine Wall. The Antonine Wall was further north of Hadrian's Wall. This is in Scotland, uh, largely between the Firth of Forth and the Loch uh, by Glasgow. And the Vindolanda, this is the bathhouse at the Vindolanda Fort on Hadrian's Wall. And Bath, Bath in England, we're used to seeing it a certain way. Originally, it had this top dome, you might say, cover on it. Mostly if you go there today, as I have done before, it's just this bottom part here. Uh, this And the street level is here. But originally, it had this top covering. Rome itself had the magnificent Colosseum, so large it could host mock naval battles under a shady awning. Besides several other smaller or practice tracks, Rome also had the Circus Maximus, seen here, reconstructed, which held up to 100,000 screaming chariot racing fans. In Rome itself could also be found, as mentioned earlier, the Stadium of Domitian, which had been built by the emperor of that name, built on a north-south axis, which opened in 86 AD for Olympic-style athletic events. This could hold up to 34,000 fans. It was found just north of the Odeon of Domitian, which he had built for musical recitals and such. Rome had a variety of open-air theaters, many with overhanging canvas awnings to provide relief from the sun, such as the theaters of Balbus, Marcellus, and Pompey, Pompey the Great himself. It also had extensive gardens open to the public, particularly on the Kirinal Esquiline and Viminal Hills, where all could go to escape the summer heat. And you see in this map here, these are the green public gardens which were open to everyone. By the time of Augustus Caesar, Rome also had 170 baths. And by the reign of Custin the Great, about 315, 320 AD, over 900 baths, nearly all private, some ex really very exclusive, along with the very large and magnificent public baths of Agrippa, Licinius Sura, Nero, Titus, Trajan, Commodus, Septimius Severus, Alexander Zephyrus, Decius, Diocletian, Constantine, and especially the truly magnificent Bats of Caracalla. As talked about elsewhere, Rome also had magnificent public libraries. The library of Pollio, and the Palatine, Octavian, Vespasian, Tiberian, and Ulpian libraries, plus a variety of magnificent public monuments, such as Nero's Colossus of Apollo. I mean, look at this thing. It was taller than the Colosseum, all of bronze. Magnificent, and then covered with gold gilt plating. Trajan's column, unfortunately, Nero's Apollo is no longer there, destroyed by the Vandals. Uh, Trajan's column, which can still be seen, and a variety of victory arches. The Arch of Augustus, the Arch of Septimius Severus, most of which you can still go and see. Rome itself was also the seat of the emperor who dwelt in the imperial palace on the Palatine Hill. Now, this began simply as Caesar Augustus's private mansion. By his time, actually by 100 BC, the Palatine was for, was really a very exclusive neighborhood. 
really for the wealthiest of Romans. And simply at first, Caesar Augustus, Octavian's, simply his private mansion. But by 235 AD, it covered the entire Palatine as seen here. It had a special entrance onto the Circus Maximus, which is this thing here. Also, its own Hippodrome, which is right here for horse racing and a series of other temples. So this would have been originally the House of Augustus and the area of Apollo, the temple, then the House of Flavia, the Domus Augustinus, uh, the Hippodrome, Severian Palace, the Septizodium, the Circus Maximum, the Palace of Tiberius, Nero's Golden Dome would have been down here, but that's for another lecture. As I said, there were, of course, many other important or magnificent buildings, monuments, bridges, structures, and other things found in ancient Rome. But that is for another talk or two or three or maybe more. Yes, and this is another depiction of the Nero's Colossus of Apollo. The wrap-up quote. In a word... The early Romans made but little account of the beauty of Rome, because they were occupied with other, greater and more necessary matters, whereas the later Romans have not fallen short in this respect either. Indeed, they have filled the city with many beautiful structures. Strabo, 20 AD. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos. And especially hit that little bell thingy, so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.